Hi everyone. Today I'm going to be comparing the vibration behavior of a 5 inch quad with that of a 7 inch quad. Now to help me do this comparison I have two nearly identical quads. I have a GEP RC Mark IV HD5 with 5045 props and 2306 motors. I'm going to call this guy Freddy the 5 inch. And I have a GEP RC Mark IV HD7 7 inch quad with uh, 7035 props and 2806 and a half motors. I'm going to call this guy Seth the 7 inch. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the black box logs of Freddy and Seth and compare them. And then we're going to look at a finite element simulation that I've done of both Freddy and Seth and see if we can't understand the differences between 5 inch and 7 inch quads. Let's get into it. Here we have a black box log side by side comparison of Freddy and Seth. And this is looking at the roll axis and we're looking at the frequency spectrograph. And uh, I've highlighted here a few key elements that I wanna talk to you about. So the first thing here are these motor harmonics. The motor harmonic first fundamental frequency and the first overtone second harmonic. And the motor harmonic number one for, for Seth and harmonic two here. So what these are is the frequencies created by the motors spinning. And like anything that resonates, there are overtones of that resonance at twice the frequency, three times the frequency, four times the frequency, and so on. And I've just picked out here the ones that are visible, so the first and second harmonic in this case. And these are gonna be the, the frequencies that are gonna excite our frame resonances. And then on top of those motor harmonics, you can see these spikes, and this is a frame resonance and this is where the motor harmonic has excited a resonance and the resonance is amplifying that motor noise and creating more vibration than you get just from the motors alone. So the first one here for Freddy the 5 inches 145 hertz this is the roll axis and then there's a second you know really significant frame resonance at 205 hertz. If we come over and look at Seth we see that there's this relatively small peak at 92 hertz, not, not much there at all. And that's, that's so small probably because if you look at that first motor harmonic, there isn't a lot of motor noise down there at 92 hertz to excite that resonance. So we only see a small spike. And there's a second frame resonance at 130 hertz. And this is, there's much more motor noise at 130 hertz, as you can see. And so that's causing a really huge spike here as that frame resonance amplifies the motor noise. And then up at around 350 hertz, we see some noise up here. This is quite broadband. Um, so this could be uh, several resonances or just one mode, but it's being excited by the second motor harmonic, which is occurring at exactly twice the, the frequency of the first harmonic. If we look now at the waterfall plot for roll, we're seeing very similar things. So here's the first motor harmonic. You can see how as we increase our throttle position, the frequency gets higher as the motors spin faster. And then just barely visible here is the second motor harmonic, which is occurring at twice the frequency. And that's just a, an overtone. And if we could see it, we should see a third and a fourth and a fifth harmonic, but at these higher frequencies, they're being really well attenuated by the hardware low pass filter in the, the gyro. So we can't actually visualize them in the plot. And then if we look for frame resonances, those frame resonances are going to be these kind of white spots that suddenly flare up inside the motor harmonic bubble. So there's one at 145 Hertz, and one at 205 hertz that, that's even brighter. And if we come over and look at Seth now, we can see there's a, a resonance being picked up at about 92 hertz. It's difficult to see, but it's, it's, it's sort of in there somewhere. And then another resonance at 130 hertz that's much more visible, much brighter. And then in the second harmonic of the motor noise, you can see that there's also some, some things going on at about 350 hertz. And we could argue that maybe they're starting to, to light up up here as well. Um, but unfortunately, I, I didn't get up high enough in the throttle on this flight to visualize stuff that's being excited by the first motor harmonic at these high throttle levels. 
but we would expect that there would be another another bright spot up there if I had if I had pushed a bit higher in the throttle on this flight. So let me show you what the mode shapes look like for this first roll mode. And what we can see is that it's again it's a, a common mode for pretty much all quadcopters where the arms are flexing alternately up and down. And this is happening at 145 hertz for Freddy the 5 inch and at 92 hertz for Seth the 7 inch. And this will be a common theme that we'll see as we go through these plots, that the Freddy the 5 inch number is always larger than the, the 7 inch number. And there's a very good reason for that, which I'll, I'll talk about towards the end of the video. If we now look at the second roll mode, we can see that this is the roll mode that that was causing, uh, has been causing some troubles for, for pretty much every frame, to be honest. It's the, the mode where the, the battery is rocking to the left and the right and the, and the arms are bending uh, up and down symmetrically and the body of the quad is rocking from side to side. And that's occurring at 205 hertz for Freddy the 5 inch and only 130 hertz for Seth. If we look now at the spectrograph for pitch, we see some some similarities certainly so these motor harmonics are still present the first harmonic here and the second harmonic here and you know you might be able to argue that you can see a third harmonic um, I mean it's definitely there but obviously it's being heavily attenuated by the hardware low pass filter in the, the gyro so you can't really see it that well and for Seth the 7 inch the same story we've got a first harmonic a second harmonic and for Seth the 7 inch because the third harmonic is occurring at a lower frequency I think we can pick it out we can see that third harmonic exists and there would be a fourth and a fifth but they're so highly attenuated at these high frequencies that they're very very difficult to see if we look now at the frame resonances we've got a resonance at 160 Hertz for Freddy the 5 inch 230 hertz for a second mode and if we come over to set the 7 inch we're going to be looking for something at 115 hertz another one close by at 145 hertz and then some third mode at about 300 hertz and what's interesting is that we don't really see a third mode for for Freddy the 5 inch in the plot anywhere it should occur at uh, above 300 hertz but uh, it doesn't seem to be very visible and um, maybe we'll talk a bit about why that might be when we look at the mode shapes. Looking now at the waterfall plot for pitch again I've circled the motor harmonics so you can you can visualize them easily first and second motor harmonic in both cases it's not really possible on the waterfall plot to easily visualize the third harmonic um, maybe if I turned up the gain a bit more it would start to appear but we know it's there and we also know that it's being highly attenuated and therefore is not too much of a problem. There's a frame resonance at 160 Hertz you can see that nice bright white spot and a second one at 230 and then if we come over to Seth the 7 inch it's 115 Hertz and 145 Hertz two resonances quite close together and then uh, at a higher frequency being excited you can see by the second motor harmonic is uh, something around 300 hertz of bright spot and again you can look there's no visible sign of a corresponding harmonic for Freddy the 5 inch over here uh, which would be occurring at a higher frequency than 300 so we should be looking at sort of you know 400 uh, and above so here we're looking at the first mode on the pitch axis and this mode initially really interested me because it's not clear that this would cause a really significant um, response on the pitch axis for the gyro because as you can see the the flight controller isn't rotating forwards and backwards in this mode it, it's just kind of bouncing up and down but there was really no other mode that made sense with these two frequencies, 160 hertz and 115 hertz for Freddie and Seth respectively. And so my initial hypothesis, and it's something I want to investigate further, is that when a quad is flying forward, this resonant mode actually affects the thrust that's generated by the front and rear motors and can therefore create a, a pitching vibration by a coupling between the resonant mode and the aerodynamics of the system. Um, and that, that could be responsible for why we see this resonant mode appearing on the pitch axis for both Freddy and Seth. 
If we look now at the second pitching mode, and this is a much more traditional pitching mode, you can see front motors moving up as the rear motors move down and the whole body of the quad pitching forward and back. And this occurs at 230 hertz for Freddie and 145 hertz for Seth. And that's that frame resonance that you can see in both the spectrograph and the waterfall plot. So this is the third pitching mode for um, only Seth actually, because we couldn't see this mode shape being really visible on Freddy the 5 inch. And I think the reason is that this mode shape with the motors bending forward and backwards together is going to occur at a very, very high frequency, a much higher frequency for Freddy the 5 inch. And so it's being very heavily attenuated. But Seth has longer arms and heavier motors, which means that um, in effect, the system is much more flexible um, for the seven inch quad. And so we can see this mode visible being excited by the second harmonic of the motor frequencies. If we look now at the yaw axis, we can see some really interesting things, particularly with Freddy. What I want to call your attention to first is the way in which the other resonant frequencies that we've already identified are coupled onto the yaw axis. So we see lots of these little small spikes. Now, what would cause this when none of these modes are, are interacting with movement in the yaw axis? Well, actually, it's the, it's the motor torque. So as the flight controller fights these rolling and pitching vibrations, it does so by alternately speeding up and slowing down motors. And whenever the motors are sped up or slowed down, they create a torque and that affects a very small movement on the yaw axis. And the flight controller, of course, detects this movement on the yaw axis and it compensates for it. But it's the nature of these motors spinning up and down, which couples all of the other modes of vibration. If they're big enough, it will couple them onto yaw and you'll be able to see them in the yaw plot. So we have to just match the frequencies and then um, really discount these as not being your modes, but being coupled roll and pitch modes visible on the yaw axis because of the motors speeding up and slowing down as the flight controller is fighting against these vibrations. When we look at this 300 hertz vibration though, there's no corresponding coupled mode. So this is a pure yaw mode, a, a yaw resonance mode. And we can see that it's being quite well excited by uh, the motor harmonics, but even, even despite that, it's, it's not a huge, huge peak. It's not a red, a red mountain, it's still in the green. And um, what that indicates is that there's plenty of damping on this mode in the quad. So it's, it's not gonna be causing too much of a problem. And to be honest, the yaw axis is quite tolerant of vibration anyway, because the quad doesn't have as much authority on yaw as it does on uh, pitch and roll. If we come over to set the seven inch, again, we can just, we can pick out, I picked out one here, which is the 145 Hertz uh, pitch mode that, that I can see is you know visibly coupled in. There, there will be others as well, but because they're quite small, they're hard to see. But there is this very, very large 210 hertz yaw mode. And that's something that, that is not coupled. That's a actual yaw frame resonance. If we look now at the waterfall plot for yaw, it's quite simple, really. I mean, we've just got the 300 hertz yaw mode and the 210 hertz yaw mode on Freddy and Seth, respectively, and uh, not much else going on because the other coupled in modes are harder to visualize on the waterfall plot. Um, they sort of fade a bit more into the background. You can sort of see maybe a few, a few down there, but the fact that they're difficult to see is, is almost a good thing because it shows you that they're not something that you, you need to be particularly worried about. If we now look at the mode shape for the yawing mode, we can start to see how um, this mode shape couples into the yaw axis. You can see that all of the motors are twisting on the arms and it's causing the body of the quad to yaw to the left and to the right. And this occurs at different frequencies depending on the length of the arm and the size of the motor. So with a shorter arm and a smaller motor, it occurs at a higher frequency because the system overall is stiffer. So having looked at all of this data, can we answer the question, 
why are all the frequencies that we've looked at, all the resonant modes, all the frame resonances for both Freddie and Seth, why are all of those frequencies lower for seven inch quads? So what I have here is just a very simple schematic of uh, the body of a quadcopter, an arm and a motor, and a simple resonance where the motor is vibrating up and down on the end of the arm. And this is like a tuning fork. You know, if you've ever used a tuning fork, you hit it against something and the tines of the fork vibrate up and down and, and you hear that as sound. And the same thing is happening in our quads. Um, the motor is a big mass on the end of this arm, which is kind of like a spring and it vibrates up and down. Or in some cases, it can vibrate by actually twisting left and right, as we saw in that, that yaw mode at the end. And the resonant frequency of a system like this can be very roughly approximated by the equation below. So here we have the equation that sort of approximates this system. This equation is for a mass on the end of a cantilever beam. And what we can see is we have uh, these different terms here. I'm going to explain what they mean. This, this term here is the frequency in Hertz. So that's what we would be looking at in our spectral graph or our waterfall plot or our resonance simulation. Here we have E. This is the Young's modulus, which is the the flexibility, if you like, of the material that the arm is made out of. So in this case, carbon fiber. I is a second moment of area, which is really looking at the cross section of the arm. So how thick it is, how wide it is. So for Freddie and Seth, and one of the reasons why I picked these two quads, is this E value is the same for both Freddie and Seth because they both have arms made of the same material, carbon fiber and both of the arms have almost identical cross section. So the I is also the same. But now if we look at the denominator of this fraction, we have F here. Now that large F represents the mass of the motor. And so we can see if we increase the mass of the motor, that makes this whole value smaller and then our frequency is gonna be lower. And this term here, L, is the length of the arm. And you can see that this L really matters because it's L cubed that actually affects this, uh, this frequency. And so as we go from a five inch quad to a seven inch quad, we increase that L. And by increasing that L, we end up reducing all of the resonant frequencies that we are concerned about where the motor is vibrating on the end of the arm. As well as having vibrations at a lower frequency, a seven inch quad also has just more noise, more vibrational power than a five inch quad. But why is that? Why should a seven inch quad have more vibration, more noise than a, an almost identical five inch quad? We can think of a motor and a prop as always being slightly out of balance. No matter how perfectly you tune everything, no matter if you hand balance your props or you, you use new props or you've got you know, really top quality motors, any system, any rotating system is always gonna be slightly out of balance. And so that's what this diagram is representing here. It's representing a, a motor and a small mass that's representing the out of balanceness of this system. So you could think of it sort of schematically as, oh, well, maybe there's just a little bit of plastic missing from the tip of one of the props. And so on the opposite side of the motor, you know, we could put a little bit of extra mass and that would kind of indicate that the, the system is out of balance. And this equation down here is talking about the centrifugal force of the system. So it's the force that this little bit of out of balanced mass exerts on the motor shaft because as all of you will know if you're swinging something around your head it's pulling on you um, and so if you have a bit of out of balanced mass that's also pulling on the shaft and as that out of balanced mass spins around the motor first it's pulling on one side of the motor then it's pulling on the other side so it's pulling the motor back and forth back and forth and that's creating vibration it's creating noise and all of these elements here, so M is the size of this little out of balanced mass. Omega squared is the uh, square of the angular velocity of the motor. So it's basically RPM, it's how fast the motor is spinning. And R is the distance that that out of balanced little mass is from the motor. So you can kind of think of it as 
basically how big the prop is, how far away this out of balance mass is from the motor. And now let's look at how all of these terms scale as we move from a 5 inch prop and motor to a 7 inch prop and motor. So the first thing is mass. Well, as you make things bigger, they get heavier and they get heavier by the, the cube of the length. Um, in general, if they're the same shape, if you increase uh, the length dimension, you have to increase it both the length, the width and the height all in all in the same proportion. And so you get a, an increase L cubed, which is an increase in volume and that leads to a, an increase in mass. So we should expect the mass of the out of balancedness of this system to increase with the cube of the size of the prop. If we look now at uh, omega, well, that's the angular rotation speed of the motor, and that actually reduces as you as you get bigger. So larger props spin more slowly, and uh, the scaling factor for that is just the length of the prop, because actually um, you often have very similar tip velocities for different sizes of prop. So this omega squared scales as uh, 1 over order L squared, so it gets smaller. And then this r, which is sort of some measure of how far out this hypothetical kind of out of balancedness is, um, that just scales with the length of the prop as well, L. And so if we, if we look at these, we can see, oh, well, we've got uh, an L cubed here and an L, so that's L to the 4, and it's divided by L squared. So we should expect the amount of centrifugal force or, or centripetal force that is pushing and pulling this motor back and forward as it spins around to increase with the square of the, of the prop size. And so that gives a very good indication that we should expect more vibrations for larger props. I hope this helps explain some of the differences that you might be seeing between your five inch and your seven inch quads in terms of noise and vibration. I'm gonna be doing another video where I look at how to improve Seth the seven inches performance with the addition of some carbon fiber parts. So make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss that. If you're finding this content valuable and you would like to support me, or you have a noise, vibration, or frame design challenge that you would like some one-on-one -on -one assistance with, please check out my Patreon, link in the video description. That brings us to the end of this video. I hope you found it interesting, and until the next time, happy flying.